but isn't if so. informatics uh, a big portion of this? So uh, from the science community, we can now produce huge amounts of data. And it's a challenge for, for even if you're a science, scientist, it's a challenge to be able to interpret that data. And if you're then a medical doctor, uh, have to treat uh, all these patients with different diseases every day uh, and sort of get this sort of massive load of data. I think we as an industry need to provide tools to be able to draw that conclusion, uh, a reliable uh, conclusion uh, that is sort of, um, you don't want to be dependent on that the doctor you see is actually a specialist of the disease that you happen to have. Uh, you want every medical doctor to be able to predict and, and treat you, uh, even though you have different uh, diseases. So I think that's uh, probably the biggest challenge in, in transforming all this, this science we have into reality for the patients. Yeah, that, as we wrote in there, as I mentioned this IT future of medicine application, <coughs> a car mechanic probably has more bits of information about the car than the doctor does about the patient currently, and that's uh, set to change dramatically, where there will be much more information available. So the aim is to build a virtual human being and be able to model processes and predict outcomes based on the input data and say that this is probably what's going on, and this may be what uh, can happen, and this drug would have a certain, uh, certain effect. Uh, that's something you can't leave to the individual doctors to keep in their minds the way it's done currently. I think the the medical profession, uh, the there are these kind of uh, new treatments like a, a product, uh, like a like a um, breath test for for detecting uh, if you have a, a Helicobacter pylori in your stomach, which causes uh, basically ulcers and so on, and uh, and it's a very easy test. It costs. Uh, I think 200 crowns, uh, 20 pounds uh, to do it, but still doctors uh, prefer to do a, a gastroendoscopy to see it, which is a very pr uh, nasty procedure and it actually costs quite much, much more money. And I, I think that this has to do with that the, the old doctors, I mean, once you're a new doctor, you come to, you start uh, your practice and you have some old doctors that you follow and then you kind of learn the old fashioned ways. So I think that the medical, uh, profession is, is, is very slow in, in adapting uh, new uh, technologies and, and, and drugs and basically the only people that they hear from these is actually the, the, the drug companies that are, are, are trying to educate them because they of course want to earn money and it's, it's kind of a weird situation uh, because uh, the drug companies basically maybe not always are, uh, the, you know, they, they are biased basically but, but still it might be that they are actually trying to promote something that would be very good for the society. Could you ever, in the high future, get to a stage where you cut out the middleman, the doctor, and you have a test, and you, have, and you know, with those results, you know what medicine is? Um, I think we, we, we <laughs> probably we're almost there, because what the, the, the middleman doctors, what I see, what they do is, when they're good, uh, they um, direct you to the specialist. Uh, so if you have a disease and you meet your, fir your first uh, discussion with your doctor, uh, you want them to pick up it to which specialist uh, should they send me. Uh, and if we can have a test that does that, um, that is reliable, um, then you only need a nurse to be able to, to take the test from you and then you directly go to the, to the specialist. And that will give a higher rate of success for treatment, I think. Um, yeah, I, I think we have embarked on that uh, path already. That there are now programs for, for any given condition, uh, hypertension. Uh, there is a program how to for any any country and uh, perhaps any region within countries usually agree on how to uh, treat the patient and what is lege uh, artis and how to deal with the patient. So you leave less to the doctor to evaluate. Problem is that uh, most of these programs do not build on on the information that we can now uh, accumulate because we haven't started using that information. So, uh, so in, in these programs for how to treat patients, we'll have to include all the data input that becomes available. I think we're probably close to wrapping up. So just on the basis that 10-year predictions are useless, um, perhaps each of you could maybe make some three-year predictions, which um, 
in terms of this concept, perhaps in your respective fields, what do you think that sort of is something that's going to come out of protein science in three years' time and look back and say, actually, yeah, they said that. That's quite good. <laughs> Lotta. Uh, I'll, I'll start with there be, um, I was thinking about the number, but I, I'll skip the number. But there will definitely be a lot more uh, protein-based drugs uh, commercially uh, used for more patients. Uh, I can predict that based on, on the information I have what's already ongoing in clinical trials. So within three years, that will have transformed to, to public health. Uh, I mean, the proteins are, are the machinery in, in the body that uh, do all these different things. And I mean, they have been the targets of, uh, I mean, all the drugs that, I mean, proteins are the targets. And, and it has been used uh, for a long time. and and. It will be used in, in the future as well, and I think that uh, uh, it might be easier to, uh, like Lotta said, to make these kind of biological uh, uh, compounds that actually uh, interact with these uh, these uh, proteins than it was before. And uh, we see in the in the stem cell field that uh, that the stem cells that you want to culture, they actually prefer certain kind of proteins because that's, that's their natural environment. And, and I would say that uh, a lot of different protein uh, uh, tools and drugs uh, will be there in three years. So from a basic protein science perspective, I think um, there are two, uh, these two areas where, where there's rapid development right now. How much we're going to know in three years, I'm not sure. But um, one is protein machines. So, you know, many central processes in the cell are carried out by very complex conglomerates of proteins, sometimes even with RNA molecules involved. Uh, and we're now actually understand, we're, we're learning a lot more about how these complex things work, uh, thanks to structural biology, so we can get structures for things like the ribosome, which is just an amazing piece of machinery, mm -hmm. but a lot of other ones as well. Um, and a, a lot of functional studies to, to go with, with these structures. And that really tells us about how things work on an atomic scale. That, you know, it's going to take a while to get this into you know, clinical applications, I think. I mean, we talk of antibodies from a protein perspective. Antibodies are very simple molecules, right? Um, but a lot of things are done by very complex, uh, complex machines. So that's one, one area where, where there is a rapid growth now. And, you know, in the next three years, we're going to find out about a number of new machines, how they work. Um, and the other areas which I'm going to talk about is membrane proteins, which is also an area where, where the basic science is moving quite rapidly right now, um, and which has been, you know, m much more difficult to deal with pr previously. Yeah, and in terms of biomarking, I think we've already touched upon it. We're currently in a log jam where there is a tremendous number of potential biomarkers being found by various efforts, my spectrometry and the, the antibody screens and, <coughs> and so forth. So we have lots, and thing, lots of things that we think might possibly be something in the, this haystack may be what we're after. Uh, and I think in uh, maybe three years' time, we will be uh, certainly a lot uh, better off in terms of having all the resources to now starting to sort through uh, uh, these candidate biomarkers and finding out which ones can really be converted to real uh, biomarkers. Uh, that will take uh, biobanking, as has been uh, touched upon, and it will take better techniques to, to look at more things in uh, these patient samples very rapidly. But I, I think in, uh, over the next few years, uh, this will, uh, things will have improved a lot, and I hope that the, the first few biomarkers are, will be coming out. Uh, or the rate at which we find new biomarkers will have started to pick up again. Excellent. Well, I, I suppose the conclusion then is <clears throat> there's some reality, there's some hope, might be a little bit of hype, but um, I, I suspect we're sort of closer to reality than hype, but um, and some stuff should change in, I think, what is the near to midterm. So I think we'll probably wind up here. I think we're going to have a coffee break now, and then um, uh, we'll come back and we've got some presentations.